Hi there, it's Julia Tarbeth here, Certified Holistic Nutritionist and Lifestyle Coach at Blossom Healthy. And I'm just so super excited to have a very special guest on our show today, Dr. Neil Barnard. Dr. Neil Barnard is a medical doctor, president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine and founder of the Barnard Medical Center. Dr. Barnard has authored more than 70 scientific publications as well as 18 books, including the New York Times bestseller, Power Foods for the Brain, 21 Day Weight Loss Kickstart, and the USA Today bestseller, Dr. Barnard's program for reversing diabetes. Dr. Barnard, welcome, and I'm really thrilled to see you here. Great. Well, it's great to be with you today. Now, I have a question, and can you share with us what led you to discover low-fat vegan lifestyle, and why did you decide to incorporate it into your doctor's practice, considering it's not really something most doctors would ever do? Well, it really should be, because food is not only a very powerful treatment, but it's really the fundamental cause of so many of the problems that our patients are dealing with. Now, a century ago, when the problem might be infections. So if bacteria were getting into the body and causing pneumonia, for example, it made sense to ignore what people were eating and concentrate on trying to find an antibiotic that might hurt them. Well, today uh, it might help them. But today, everything is really quite different. The conditions that most people are dealing with, weight problems or diabetes or hypertension or heart disease, those aren't caused by bacteria. They're caused by the foods that we're putting on our plates. So that's really where our attention has to go. So it's true that not every doctor is really there yet, but they really should be because that's, that's how we're going to help patients. I totally, absolutely agree with you. Now, I wanted to ask you about being overweight. And I know it's a big problem in our, in our world. And in fact, according to the World Health Organization, back in 2014, there were more than 1.9 billion overweight people on our planet. And usually when, when people are overweight, they tend to blame their genes. They, ju they just say it's just the way of life. It's because it's in my genes. What are your thoughts on this? You know, it, it, it's... It's sort of logical because a person would say, well, my, my parents were overweight, my brothers and sisters are overweight, and so I'm just going to be overweight. It must be genetic. But you know, we don't just hand our children DNA. We also hand them recipes and, we, and tastes for food, different kinds of foods and that sort of thing. So what, sometimes what runs through a family is not a genetic trait, but rather cultural preferences of uh, for certain foods. For me, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. And so every day of my life, it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and corn, except for special occasions when it was roast beef, baked potatoes, and peas. And that was pretty much the way we ate. And th there's an important thing to, to really understand about genes. There are some genes that are very decisive. For example, um, there are genes that are, will affect the color of your eyes. And I think of them as dictator genes. If the genes say you're going to have blue eyes, then you're going to have blue eyes. These genes are dictators and they give orders and that's it. But the genes for weight are not really dictators. They're more like committees. Um, they say, well, you could be overweight depending on what you eat. Um, or you're going to be thin depending on what you eat. But what they're really making is sort of suggestions rather than giving orders. So... The good news is, let's say everybody in your family was having a weight challenge, but you decide to make a big change in your diet. You throw out the meat, throw out the cheese, throw out the grease. Are you going to be slimmer than them? Absolutely you are. Um, our studies and, and those of many other groups show that whatever genetic hand you have been dealt, we can change this. So genes are not destiny. That's great. It's so empowering. It's also empowering for people to know that they, that they can make changes to their, to their lifestyle and to their weight. Now, there are a lot of um, approaches to different approaches to diet and people are often confused. For example, paleo and ketogenic diet will tell you to not eat carbohydrates if you want to lose weight, but instead focus on high protein and high fat um, uh, approach in your diet. So what are some of the implications of this diet on people's health and weight? Yeah, uh, the, the paleo trend has been um, an understandably popular because it, it's, it conjures up nice images. We can imagine ourselves being successful hunters and um, 
uh, it's sort of a romantic period of time when we were out wearing loincloths and taking a spear and felling an antelope and, and uh, being rather macho. Um, and so the paleo idea was that the paleolithic period is in the mind's eye of these book writers, it's after the stone age. So we've got stone tools and we've got hatchets and we've got spears, but it's before we figured out how to plant anything. So they say, well, let's make a diet that's got meat in it because now we've got spears, but we're not gonna eat anything that requires putting a seed in the ground because we're not that smart. Um, so no grains and no beans because those require planting, but we'll, ha uh, we'll have meat. And it's true that a person in theory could lose weight that way because so many of the foods that we eat now require <laughs> agriculture. And if you're not gonna eat anything that's planted, um, you'll, lose, you'll certainly lose weight. But it's really a fantasy, because if you look back further as uh, you, before the paleo period, you understand that people really biologically are in the category of great apes, uh, like chimpanzees and orangutans and gorillas and bonobos. Um, we are the animals who are not carnivorous at all. Um, we pick fruit or leaves and we stick them in our mouths. And that's what all the great apes do, including us. And we don't have long canine teeth. The, the canine teeth in the human mouth are no longer than your incisors. And that change occurred at least three and a half million years ago. So the Stone Age gave us arrowheads because we're not very fast and we can't capture prey, but an arrow can fly fast through the air and make us pretend we're a, car we're a carnivore. Or they give us hatchets and stone tools to allow us to dismember prey when we don't have the teeth or claws for it. So no, we are not carnivores. We never have been carnivores. And the Stone Age was simply a, a time that allowed us to pretend to be carnivores. But we still have the coronary arteries and uh, digestive tracts of herbivores, and that's the, the natural diet for us. So it's no surprise that when people go to an herbivorous diet, which you might call a vegan diet, um, they lose weight and they get back uh, toward the kind of health that nature had in mind for them. Can you explain a little bit more how it happens? So why is it that when people switch to low fat, uh, plant-based vegan lifestyle, they start to lose weight. But not only that, they start to balance type 2 diabetes and other diseases and hormonal challenges amongst um, menopausal females. Um, so, so, in other words, why is it that when person, a person goes on a vegan diet, why do they lose weight so effectively? Why do they get healthy? Right. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting thing because when we do research studies here, which we're, we're doing currently and we, we do all the time, we introduce people to vegan diets and they can't imagine that this could cause them to lose weight because we're letting them eat as much food as they want to. And we're not telling them not to eat carbohydrates. We're telling them to go ahead and jump in and, and have um, the carbohydrate rich foods if they, if they want to. And especially if they have diabetes, they're afraid of fruit because uh, fruit's sweet. That's going to hurt me, isn't it? Um, but they jump in, they eat these things and they do really, really well. They lose weight. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is they're not eating very much fat. They're not eating any cheese fat or chicken fat or beef fat. And fat has nine calories in every gram. And if you're not eating that, you're gonna lose weight. Um, carbohydrate, whether it's from a fruit or a grain or a bean or anything, or even from pure sugar, it has only four calories per gram. So when people switch away from the fatty foods, they tend to lose weight. Also, if everything you're eating is from a plant, plants have fiber, Fiber is filling, but it really doesn't have much in the way of calories. So you feel full and you stop eating before you've overdone it. So these are reasons why people tend to lose weight. We also think that it improves body metabolism, but that's another issue that we're investigating now. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Now, do you think people can still include plant-based fat into their diet? So let's say it's avocados or nuts or seeds if they're looking to lose weight. Well, those are natural fats. Um, where I think we run into trouble is when we are extracting fats. Uh, for example, if I take 10,000 olives and I extract the oil and I throw away all of the pulp and all the fiber and I put it in a bottle and I call it virgin, um, then that, that virgin olive oil sounds attractive, but it's really not natural for us. But on the other hand, if I take an olive and I pop it in my mouth, I'm getting the traces of olive oil. There's a difference between those two. Your body needs traces of oil. 
but it doesn't need oil slathered all over the foods that you're eating. So uh, th those are the ones I'm concerned about. But if a person eats nuts or if you eat seeds or if you eat some avocado slices, you're getting the oil in a natural form. Um, if a person is really struggling with their weight and they've they followed a, a meaty diet and they're trying to lose weight, or if they're trying to reverse diabetes, they, might, they may need to be careful about all sources of oil, including the nuts and the avocado while they're losing weight. Um, because there, because those, there, there are very few plant foods that are really rich in oil, and, and that's really kind of the list, the nuts and the seeds and the avocados. Um, and uh, they are rather calorie dense. But on the other hand, for most people, they can incorporate these foods with no, no problem at all. Um, I might mention one other thing. There's, there are natural oils, even in vegetables. If you have a leaf of spinach or something like that, and you send it to a laboratory, I'll tell you it's maybe seven or eight percent fat as a percentage of calories and a high proportion of that fat is omega-3 so there's not a lot of fat in them but the fat that there is is healthy for you that's fantastic yes yeah i'm sure it's gonna help a lot of people to understand the healthy types of vegan fats and unhealthy yeah. types of vegan fats now moving on a lot of people suffer from food addiction so it's Specifically, people who want to, to lose weight, it's like it's a psychological issue for a lot of them, and they go back to old foods because they're addicted to them. So, what you what would you recommend them doing? Um, I, well, the first thing is, when, if a person feels that they're food addicted, it's good for them to know that it's not them; it's the food that's doing it. In other words, it's not a bad childhood. It's not um, a history of trauma or something like that for, them, for most people. It's really certain foods have properties that make them, they have certain properties that, that affect the brain and make us come back to them over and over again. Sugar is the obvious example. Um, if I'm having a soda, um, the, the sugar will go to the brain and trigger the release of opiates that are sort of feel good chemicals. Um, they also have a little caffeine to boost it even further. And those, that just happens to be addictive. We've seen this with cheese, which is funny because it smells like old socks and yet people get hooked on it. Um, we found that there are mild opiates in cheese too. They're called casomorphins and they attach to the brain at the very same binding sites that heroin would attach to. They're not as strong, but they're strong enough to make people want that. Um, chocolate has a variety of brain effects um, as well. And so when a person is just stuffing themselves with food, um, I guarantee you, there is nobody who was ever addicted to strawberries or grapes or papayas or mangoes. I mean, we may, we may love these foods. This morning I had a papaya and I had a mango and I loved it, but you know what? I didn't eat seven of them. Um, you have one and you think that's just delicious. Maybe I'll have one again tomorrow because these foods are nourishing, they're delicious, they have the nutrition you need but they're not going to play haywire with your brain. It's so true. And for those who really, really just still believe that it's um, impossible to, to, to break food addictions, I've been eating low fat, mostly raw vegan myself for eight years, and it's just so liberating to be free of food addictions. It changes your life in so many positive ways. Dr. Barnard, last but not least, can you tell us where can people connect to you and find out more about your life-changing books? Oh, well, thank you. We're here in Washington, D.C. at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And so our website is pcrm.org. And if you're ever in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, which I can't say I necessarily recommend right at the moment, but on the other hand, if you're here, I hope you'll drop by and visit. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to have you on our show. And it's just, it's so incredible, the, the, the positive impact that you bring into this world, the light that you shine. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to have you here. Well, thank you. It's very much a team effort. And I'm grateful to you for spreading the good word. Thank you. Thank you.